Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, it's Dr. Joe Tata. Welcome to this week's show, this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. If you can tell, this week we have two incredible guests. I'm so excited to bring uh, two guests with some really incredible experience and some research behind them to talk about a really important topic, which is bringing ACT to an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, pain clinic setting. My guest this week is physical therapist Corinne Cooley and psychologist Heather King. First, I'll tell you about Corinne. Corinne is a physical therapist at the Stanford Pain Management Center and clinical residency faculty member in the Stanford Orthopedic Clinical Residency Program in California. She works with pain physicians and pain psychologists to help optimize complex patient case plans and leads the exercise and movement portion of interdisciplinary outpatient programs. And psychologist Heather King is clinical associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Pain Medicine, and also serves as the director of the Pain Psychology Fellowship at Stanford. Her areas of expertise are cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, as well as insomnia and acceptance and commitment therapy. On today's episode, we'll discuss a investigation that Corinne and Heather were both involved in, where the study included an outpatient interdisciplinary approach with pain psychology using ACT, as well as physical therapy, and compared that to traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. So in essence, this was an ACT plus PT intervention compared to a cognitive behavioral therapy intervention alone. They got some really interesting data and some results to share, and they really share how they went about um, investigating this topic and some of the outcomes as well as the patient population and how ACT really flowed through the psychology as well as the physical therapy part of care. As you know, I'm a little biased to mindfulness and acceptance-based approaches to living life to the fullest, especially with chronic pain. That's why I'm so excited to share both Corinne and Heather with you today. They also use ACT as their primary form of cognitive behavioral therapy um, in their treatment. Just a reminder, if you want to learn more about ACT for chronic pain, there's two great resources for you. The first is my book, which is called Radical Relief. And the second is our course, Act for Chronic Pain, here at the Integrated Pain Science Institute. But really take the time today to listen about some of the topics we're talking about with regard to chronic pain, both on how ACT can help the, the psychological aspect as well as the physical aspect of pain, and how Heather and Corinne really work together as this really tight interdisciplinary team, which I think is really important in the study they created. And hopefully we can see more of this um, in healthcare settings. I do mention the title of the paper and where you can access the paper, what journal it's been published in, in the beginning of the episode in just a couple of moments. I highly recommend if you're a professional to download it. It is open access and you can read um, either the paper and follow along with the podcast, or you can listen to today's episode and then read the paper after. Okay, without further ado, let's begin and let's meet physical therapist Corinne Cooley and psychologist Heather King. Hi there, Corinne and Heather. Thanks for joining me this week on the podcast. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Very excited to be here, Joe. We're very excited. So I'm excited to talk to both of you, both a, a physical therapist and a psychologist who are doing really interesting work in the realm of like multidisciplinary, multimodal care. Um, we're, of course, going to be talking mostly today about some of the research that you've published with other colleagues. I always want to um, mention the paper because oftentimes professionals want to read it for themselves or they want to use it for a resource. So the, the manuscript that you publish is called Effectiveness of a Multidisciplinary Rehabilitation Program in Real-World Patients with Chronic Pain, a Pilot Cohort Data Analysis, and everyone can find that in the June 2021 Journal of Back and Musculoskeletal Rehabilitation. So Heather, let's start with you. Um, what was the, the driving force behind developing um, an intensive outpatient program using ACT as part of the, the Stanford approach to treating pain. I know there's lots of other approaches happening at Stanford and not lots of the things that are researching. Why this particular approach? Yeah, Joe, thanks for, again, having us on. Uh, we're really excited to be here and to talk about our program. So, you know, the, the process of developing back in action 
really started back in 2012. So that's when I came on board to Stanford. I was recruited to come in and uh, work with the pain psychology fellow, so to be a primary supervisor, and also to bring new clinical programs on board. Um, I, I come from a, rest, a functional restoration program through the workman's compensation system. So I was hired to develop the psychological aspects of a, a new um, program that was launched a number of years ago. So when I came into Stanford, I really wanted to increase clinical offerings. There was one CBT group that was being offered at that time. And so I worked with the previous physical therapist to bring in the first uh, coping skills and movement group. So it was a CBT based group. And then there was Tai Chi and yoga. And then when Crin came on board, we started to co-lead that group. And so we had the opportunity to work together uh, from that standpoint of running the CBT and coping skills movement group, and then also to share a number of patients, individual patients. So she was seeing them in physical therapy, and then I was seeing them for pain psychology. So our progression started with just talking back and forth about the different control-based strategies. So these are the CBT-based strategies. And then over time, uh, because I also run an ACT group at Stanford, I had implemented that, I started sharing this information with Corinne of moving them toward their goals. And so Crin was open and willing to learn more about the psychological flexibility model as another tool. I don't even like to call it a tool, but as another skill set that we could implement to help patients, you know, people living with persistent pain to move for the things that are truly meaningful to them, whether it's getting back to work, school, or even just you know, spending time with their family, learning to say yes versus no. And so that's how it really started. And then seeing how effective these tools were, Crin started to do different trainings, which I think she'll get into. Um, she can talk about that herself, but we really spent a lot of time going over, how do we put this all together? How do we take the pain neuroscience education piece? That's really the foundation of helping people get unstuck the CBT tools that are helpful, but then integrating the psychological flexibility model in an interdisciplinary setting, in an outpatient setting. And so we started off researching to see, well, why recreate the wheel, right? If someone's already doing this, maybe something that we could do. And honestly, we couldn't find anything in the United States that was being offered that followed what we were looking for at that time. It was being done in Europe. There was research on it, but these were all all inpatient groups. And so that's really how it started. We sat down and like, what are the best pieces of all this? Put it together, um, got support through leadership and then launched it in this, this outpatient setting. It's interesting. So you, you mentioned no one's doing similar work to this at that time, at least in that the we US. know of, right. Yeah. That, that we know of in the U S or at least you didn't see it in the, in the literature. You haven't found anything in the literature. Yes. Yeah. So you mentioned control for a minute, and I, I know we have a lot of questions to go through. I just want to kind of give people some context. I think it will help as we talk about the rest of the, the podcast, Heather. So you mentioned control, which is um, as part of CBT, we teach people techniques or skills to help mm -hmm. control their pain. Um, ACT is also a part of this study as well. Can you talk to us about the differences just between the, the concept really of controlling pain versus how ACT approaches pain? Absolutely. That's such a good question. So with the CBT strategies, even when we pitch them to patients and I hear other pain psychologists talk, we talk about turning the volume down on pain. The ultimate goal of CBT is to turn the volume down on pain, whether that is through basic self-regulation, relaxation, activity pacing, even cognitive restructuring of changing how we think so that we can um, change that bi-directional um, signaling that's happening. But the, we are focusing on turning the volume down on pain, which Crin and I, so we presented at pain week and we called it the carrot versus the stick or something like that. I can't remember the name, but the stick is really about avoiding pain, reducing pain, changing pain. And so when we think of acceptance and commitment therapy, or whether you want to call it just the psychological flexibility model, it's less about pain 
And it's more about following, taking steps in the moment repeatedly that move you toward things in your life that bring you deep meaning and pleasure and satisfaction. And then when things show up, like your thoughts, your memories, your sensations, how do you change your relationship with those things so that they don't hijack your behavior? What we find is that ultimately it actually is changing the pain response, but that's not really the philosophy behind it. You're getting, I think of this as like optimizing everyone's resilience. Like what are the things that really help you be you and motivate you to move forward? And so we're tapping into that. And so that would be the carrot, right? That would be the, what are you moving toward and helping people get unstuck from these thoughts that tell them, I can't do that. I'll never be able to do that. Or even the fear and anxiety that shows up. So we're really changing. Well, the person is changing their relationship with all of that through the psychological flexibility model. And then they've got the roadmap of where am I going? And then what does that look like today in an hour tomorrow? It's, it's really a map to help them live a full, vibrant life with whatever they have going on, whether it's pain, whether it's anxiety, whether it's fear, whether it's depression. Excellent. I want to come back to some of those topics later on, but I want to bring Corinne into the conversation. Corinne, I mean, as a PT, you're doing some groundbreaking <laughs> work, both in the clinic by implementing psychologically informed care via ACT. And obviously now you're, you know, being involved in research. So you're really straddling two areas. I commend you on, I mean, there's really, I can't think of, it's probably only a small handful of maybe three or four PTs in the world who are doing this kind of work. Tell me about like kind of your, obviously you're working with Heather closely. So Heather is supporting you through this process, but tell me about kind of like your initial um, kind of entry point into ACT and, and just how it differs from just being a, what we would consider, quote unquote, a traditional PT, whatever, whatever that means nowadays. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Joe. So it, it's hard to start my journey without mentioning Heather, because it wouldn't, I've never would have learned to act or been exposed to act if I wouldn't have been at Stanford and had that I mean, close relationship with a pain psychologist I could work with. Um, but I will go back a little bit before that. And I was lucky enough in my residency program to get a pain management course, right? It's, and now even in PT schools, they're starting to integrate pain management and exposure to CBT, motivational interviewing, other um, techniques that you would see a pain PT use in pain neuroscience education. Um, and so once we, once, you know, I came to Stanford, I was a little bit resistant um, I, I was kind of asking Heather one day about a mutual patient at will, you know, they're really fearful. Is the cognitive restructuring going well? And then, you know, she brings in this psychological flexibility of sitting with the discomfort. And that is very, uh, sitting with thoughts, whatever comes up. And that was very, uh, hard to hear as a PT, right? Like fix it, get it better, fix this problem. So shifting to this pain control, fix it mode to, still supporting the patient, wanting to help them move forward, but maybe with what they're bringing. Um, it took a lot of training <laughs> and practice and mentorship. Um, so one of the first uh, trainings I went to was through the American Association of the Pain Psychologists. Um, Robin Walsler uh, led a day course, kind of foundations of ACT, going behind CBT and uh, the different theories that the ACT was developed on. And then um, I was invited, to, Heather invited me to a intensive boot camp uh, on ACT. And that was a four day course where you're watching um, advanced practitioners uh, show the experiential uh, exercises, take you through those. And it really um, requires you to dig deep internally. Um, so it becomes very emotional, thinking about your own struggles. And I've that was definitely a helpful piece for me to understand how the patients are struggling um, and themselves. And so one thing I, as a physical therapist um, value is I'm not going to ask a patient to do something I wouldn't do, right? Whether it's exercise, I always want to make sure I've tried, tried it on first, I guess. Um, and so really going through that helped me see, wow, okay, this is how it is to be someone that's struggling with these things all the time um, and how powerful it can be to have a different 
outlook, different, different, different strategies rather than the CBT model. Um, and so uh, that was kind of my journey. And then one of the things I did to build upon that was I took actually your course, which was great. It provided lots of language, metaphors, and handouts that we were already using in our group. Um, but for someone that's not familiar with ACT, it's a great um, PT focused uh, course. Um, so that was our, my journey with ACT. And I would say uh, I still use it for myself <laughs> today. Um, and I definitely enjoy using it with um, the patients that I'm working with. It kind of provides a whole nother, it just opens up a whole nother lane, if you will, on what you can work on and what they're willing to do and, um, and, and, and gains that you can make in the gym. Yeah, it's interesting to for us to think about it as, as PTs and maybe even for Heather to I'm sure she's experienced this as she's worked with, with other professionals, not just PTs, but um, even if even if there aren't intentionally co traditional cognitive behavioral interventions inserted into PT education, what we do as PTs really does kind of fit along the lines of more a traditional cognitive behavioral intervention. So even if you've never trained in CBT, mm -hmm. I think we just kind of naturally have that, that mindset. And then pain neuroscience education has brought in Again, I think it's, I look at pain neuroscience education as um, taking like the psychoeducation part of it and just really building it out into a big, <clears throat> yes. you know, treatment technique and that work needed to be done. I guess my, my question for you, Corinne, is where along this process in learning ACT and starting to use it in practice, or maybe you haven't come to this point yet, I don't know, I don't want to insert my opinion here, but <laughs> when did you come to the point where you said to yourself, or have you come to the point where you said, this is actually a much more refreshing way to approach people. Hmm. And it takes some stress off me as a practitioner. Oh, that, that was a huge moment. Um, I think I have come to that point. Um, and it's been very helpful for me to get, prevent burnout for myself also to be willing, right. To explore other avenues that I might not have with, with patients. So, and also, be less concerned, still concerned about the outcomes. I still want patients to make progress, but less concerned about maybe how those outcomes come about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm hopeful to try to model psychological flexibility as much as I can. Um, but I think that that point happened at the boot camp when, when you're really taken through all those experiential exercises and feeling it yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it acts as an experiential therapy, if you will. Yeah. And it's almost hard to explain, <laughs> um, but we, I know, I know Heather does a great job when she's explaining it. Um, and we'll, we'll see that today. Heather, can you talk to us about some of the, the kind of the components of the program? I know there's a, a CBT component, uh -huh. which I believe it was like a six or a seven session CBT intervention. And then you compared that to the back in action. I love that, that, that um, kind of phrase you have there for the program, but tell us how the back in action is, is different from the, the CBT, if you can kind of summarize that for us. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way that the back in action program is different than the CBT group, that is what you're asking about, right, Joe? Um, so the CBT groups are two hours, once a week for eight weeks, and it's the basic CBT protocol, right? So you've got a little bit of, we have neuroscience education and everything. Like I said, I think it's just the foundation if you're going to work with people with pain, um, so we go through the difference between like acute and chronic pain, um, the role of the brain in that turning the volume up or down on pain, and then things like sleep hygiene, activity pacing, cognitive restructuring, basic goal setting, you know, the standard CBT stuff. Back in action is a little different. I feel like we've taken, of course, I'm very biased in this, right, because we developed it. <laughs> But I feel like we've taken the best of everything that we have and put it into this program. So the way that it works is it's four hours twice a week for six weeks. So it's very intensive. We start off with basic pain neuroscience education and a couple sessions of the basic CBT skills. So things like activity pacing, which I think are really important. We also tackle sleep because we know comorbid pain and insomnia is a big issue. And I'm also passionate about treating sleep. So we go through that, but then we move into the flex, the flexibility model. So we go through diffusion and mindfulness and values and committed action and self as context. And we infuse that throughout, honestly, throughout the whole program, but more targeted experiential exercises, probably week three, Corinne, I think that's when 
week three is when it's a little bit more obvious, I think, probably to the patients, even though, again, we're talking about values and dropping, you know, all of these strategies along the way, but more targeted experiential exercises, week three, four, five, and and six of the back in action program. And then of course, they've got the gym component with Corinne um, and then the movement piece as well. So we're kind of targeting avoidance from the physical domains and strengthening and stamina and all that through what Corinne is doing with them in the gym and the movement piece. So are any of the, the patients or clients, are they have they picked up on the fact that maybe in the beginning, you're talking about some more skills and I don't know if you specifically mentioned cognitive restructuring, you're working on cognitive restructuring and then later on working on more diffusion, which sometimes people can pick up on if they're really kind of keen and paying attention to the, to the distinctions between the two. Yeah, I think I try to be as transparent as I feel is helpful, to be honest. So like here, so here are be- two different ways you can approach this basically. Yeah. And yeah. I'll go through like, we're, we're laying this out of, of this. I mean, I might not use the word diffusion with a patient, right? But, um, and so when we get to week three and we're going through like the control agenda and they're looking to see how all these control strategies that they've used, understandably, like they get an A plus on effort from everything that they have tried. It's, it's impressive how hard people work to get better. It's just sad that a lot of these things don't work. So when we go through that and they're starting to see all the control based strategies and then the impact that it's had short term on their pain, long term on their pain and the impact it's had on their quality of life. I think that's when things really start to settle in of, oh, okay, that doesn't work. And then they're utterly confused, which is exactly where you want them to be. And then we turn that confusion into curiosity and pivoting moments, right? Choice, choosing to do something different, but bringing a lot of this into their conscious awareness so that they know what's happening. Um, And so I I think there's a lot of transparency in how things are being delivered. um, And most of it is experientially. So I'm trying to move them out of this cognitively explain it to me. I can't do that. Right. Let's feel it. Let's notice it. Let's shift it. What happens. And so that's, we also save a a lot of that for week three after we sort of grounded them. Camaraderie has been built. Trust is built. Hope has been instilled. And then we move them into more of the experiential pieces. Um, And it's a little rocky for them, you know, week three and four, it's, it's a lot, but again, as Corinne mentioned, learning to sit with that as a provider is incredibly powerful because if you can't sit with your discomfort, how on earth are you going to ask the person to sit with their discomfort? Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there's a lot packed into this program, right? It's a lot. And I think one of the most amazing things, and Prin, you can certainly speak um, on this as well. The change you see is amazing. Like the, It's just, it's why we do what we do. You know, Corinne and I are clinicians. Yes, we carve out some research time and because we want to collect our outcomes, but this isn't, you know, this is on real world patients. Yeah. We haven't screened out anything for it. Yeah. I mean, as I'm going through the study and I'm looking at, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very well put together structured program, obviously, which is why you have such good results. What I appreciate about it is that there's a little bit of a trend depending what lab you're coming from and how you're looking at pain of trying to figure out how can we return the person back to function the shortest amount of time possible with like either a brief intervention of, you know, maybe just a couple of sessions or maybe just one session. I think it's important that we explore those things because of course, if we can return someone back to full function within just a one, two hour session, awesome. Then we should all be doing that. However, when I read those studies and I want to kind of relate this back to in, you know, in your, um, study, you mentioned real world patients, um, real world in my, in my lens, real world patients, um, are not just a homogenous group of people. They're, they're people with many different types of comorbidities, different ages, mm-hmm. different sex and mm-hmm. gender and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when, when I look at something like this, I feel like this fits better into what we see in real life practices. Why you mentioned 
real world patients. Yeah, I mean, we're clinicians, Joe. And um, anything I do research wise is, you know, I'm a master CBT trainer, facilitator for the research group, but clinic, you know, we're clinicians. So we know that, you know, we can do an intervention with someone by just doing an evaluation and providing pain neuroscience education that sometimes can help someone get better. We do individual treatment that can help. We just wanted to create something that was intensive. It is covered by insurance. We've been able to get insurance coverage that we could put everything that we believed as, as providers into this to help the people we work with meet their specific outcomes. And their outcomes are a full, meaningful life. And that's really where we were coming at this from. Yes, we ended up collecting some outcomes and publishing on it, which is lovely. But basically, Crin and I wanted to help people make a change to better their lives. Like that was, I think, our values as providers behind doing this. Crin, how did you how did you work act into the work you were doing um, in physical therapy? Oh yeah, so this getting the concepts into the gym was um, we had to be creative with this. So. Um, often, and this is why the structure of the weeks is sometimes helpful for our program when Heather focused on a specific topic. So if we wanted to bring up, um, the passengers on the bus metaphor, um, I created kind of these laminated cards. And so whenever someone was doing their warm up um, on the cardio, so they could be doing the elliptical or the treadmill or the bike, um, they would have these cards um, as soon as they walked into the gym straight from their pain psychology um, sessions. And I go around and just like checking in on how are things going? This is the prompt. So bringing it into, okay, so what pas passengers are showing up for you today? And all that means, right, is what are you bringing in with you um, today? Could be pain, could be confusion from the pain psychology part, or, you know, it could be, you know, anger, any, anything that comes with you. And then each week that progresses. So now, you know, the week next week would be who is driving the bus, um, right? And, and, and how would I know as the physical therapist where we're going? Um, and then hopefully by the last week, the, the question is what, um, what is this exercise that you're doing now? So it might be specific exercise, like walking on the treadmill. It might be strengthening something that you've given. How is that moving you towards your values? So kind of combining the values and the committed action piece um, together. And by the end of the program, they can answer all of those questions um, on their own. So I think the other piece about that we wanted to create was a program that was comprehensive. We wanted patients to try do it right and be able to answer it once we finish the program so they wouldn't be left with oh now i have to go back to my life and i don't know how to implement these strategies that's another reason why it's twice a week is so that on those other days they can go home practice see what it's going to look like for them at home um, not just in our controlled environment in the gym i like what you said there corinne you said how would i know so being a being a, a pt yeah. How do I know, in essence, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what you're sensing mm -hmm. in your body? What's the experience you're having right now? I think that's so key because as PTs are really good at exposure, graded exposure, pain exposure, it's, it, it's like our bread and butter almost, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to me to think before I learned ACT, I didn't have these skills and I was exposing people to things that were difficult and challenging. But now that you, know, you have these similar skills, Corinne, that you can use those skills to support that type of exposure that happens naturally in PT, because there is an aspect of, of physical rehabilitation when you're in pain that sometimes it's not comfortable physically or, or emotionally. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think we, uh, that's another thing that I think Heather sets the stage so well and, and having these components together, right? So there is a space where patients can express concern at anything that they have in the gym. Corinne, I think what some physical therapists out there would like to like to know is you have these physical therapy skills, obviously that you're working on. You also have some act skills that you bring in. How are you like integrating those together? So are they just laid over, let's say exercise in manual therapy and physical activity? Are there times where you're reinforcing, let's say a, a metaphor or an exercise that Heather's using in in psychotherapy, like where you set aside some time for that? How does that look in, in, in your practice? Okay. Um, 
so in the, in the, is it okay if I stick to what we did in the group? Is that right? Um, so in the group time, um, like you said, I, I kind of bring the specific metaphors during different parts of the gym. Um, and so that's planned. Um, however, I think once you learn act, it's hard to turn it off. <laughs> so you're always evaluating in that moment with this, with the person, right? What am I, um, where are my biases? What am I maybe struggling with? Um, what do I want for the patient? And then grounding yourself. Well, what does the patient want for themselves? And it, it, what am I doing supporting that? So if, um, if, for example, we often will have patients, I know as physical therapists, they come in like, I can't do this today. I'm too flared up or I have too much pain and I don't want to do my exercises or I don't think they'll be helpful. Um, and so a very good metaphor would be tugging on the rope in that example. And kind of once they've learned the metaphor, you can use that language. Um, if they haven't learned that, you might need to introduce it. Well, okay, I notice, I appreciate you coming in today. First of all, that's brave of you, right? Acknowledge what they had to do to get here. How can we help you? You mentioned, again, last time for day one, your value was you wanted to get back to running or you wanted to get back to walking with your partner. Okay, so if you're how can we work towards that value? And I think for PTs, it's easiest to, to get back to values. But then you might need to start with a different type of exercise, um, maybe some mindfulness or uh, some diffusion around how, what they're coming in with so they can get enough space or they can meet you where they can take the step forward because they can't see it, I guess, would be my initial response. They can't see how they could get there now. And uh -huh. it's a process to get to, to be able to see it. And Heather, you can certainly add in, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think Corinne is... Crin does a phenomenal job of incorporating everything that has been taught in the psychological portion with, with me. So she's able to ask the patients when they are engaging in what maybe a physical therapist would see as avoidance to ask what's showing up on your bus. You know, what, what do you think it would look like? Do you think, you know, are you tugging on the rope? Or are you dropping the rope? And they all, the patients know we're using the same language, which I think is also incredibly powerful. It certainly has been for our program of everybody is working, like all the cooks in the kitchen are working from the same recipe. And that really does matter because otherwise someone undoes it unwittingly. And so she's able to ask them. And then it, what it does is it brings it into conscious awareness for the person who's experiencing it. And then maybe they sit and do their five minutes of mindfulness meditation, or maybe it's time to do the leaves on a stream and then be able to pivot, make a choice, right? Because they get to make that choice. They're adults. This is their program. They get to make a choice of, am I going to choose something different? And they can actually see the possibilities now where when you're fused with it, I can't do it. It's not possible. There's no room for choice. And so I think Corinne is able to bring that into their conscious awareness by asking these questions and supporting them so that they ultimately can make the choice because that's what we need. We need patients to make the choice to self-manage in a way that brings them closer to their goals. But you can't make a choice if you don't realize that there's a split in the road. It's always the same road. And, and fear usually drives it, right? So I think we should talk about some of the outcomes, Heather, maybe you want to share some of the outcomes that really stood out and separate, separated this from what's been done in the past as far as the, the objective outcomes of the study. Yeah, I'm actually going to turn this over to Corinne because Corinne is super excited to talk about the outcomes. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, as a physical therapist, she likes data. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I do, I think one of the surprising, um, baseline things that we found when we ran these two, like looked at, looked at who was in the groups was that their baseline demographics were similar. So what that means, um, is, you know, they had similar symptoms of mood, mood interference, so anxiety, depression, um, Again, you mentioned the comorbidities, so that was true also. 67% um, of the patients that were enrolled had comorbidities. So you're dealing with, you know, not just pain, but other, other factors that might influence, you know, the difficulty with activities. Um, and then at uh, the changes um, were great in that both groups improved on many of our measures. So mood, uh, so depression, anxiety, fatigue, 
social role satisfaction um, and pain interference. So how much pain interferes with your activities all improved significantly with both groups. So we were happy with that, right? That means both interventions are helping patients, right? Um, And the big difference was that only with the multidisciplinary, so the back in action program um, was mobility. So their their function that they reported they could do um, and their pain behavior improved. Whereas those did not change in the um, CBT group only. Um, And something that also stood out to me was that the, I I know in an intensive program, right? 12 sessions of four hours, twice a week, uh, our attendance rate was very high. So 11 out of five, five out of 12 sessions were attended. Um, and so people, once they committed, they were able to commit and come. Um, I think sometimes with research, you see dropouts and even with your own patients, you see, you know, they miss a session. Um, so that was important to see is that they were committed. They, they made it and there were some differences between the groups. Um, the other um, thing that I wanted to bring up is that we do have some unpublished data on their satisfaction with the groups. Um, and this, of course, stood out to me because they rated the, the pain psychology, the act components of group versus being in the gym or um, doing the yoga on Tai Chi. And once they completed the group, the highest ratings were with the act components. Um, and this is surprising, right? As a, as a PT, they still start and they want to their focus is maybe doing the exercise or, you know, improving their health and maybe not so much on the, the act and the pain psychology pieces. But once they finish the program, they basically can't stop raving about it and how much it changed their life. And that was another thing for me as a PT to see, wow, this is very powerful. This is something that lasts and is going to stick with them for the rest of their life. Which is the beautiful thing about psychologic flexibility, I think is you can measure yeah. it, right? It's a construct. You can measure it. I've seen it measured a year later. And I, I love, there's a paper out there that talks about it as far as a resiliency factor. I think is so important. Like just to think about how can we help people be more resilient, right? Because for many of these patients, um, with especially with comorbid health conditions, pain might come back around at some point, right? So once they're done with the program, yeah. maybe, I don't know, two years from now, there might be something that happens in life, stressful event or... Um, another injury, so to speak, that requires resiliency of you as a human to be able to, okay, how can I face this and how can I overcome this basically? Um, Heather, I want to ask you a question. So obviously I, the, the key thing that I, when I read this and Corinne mentioned it is um, in the back in action group, physical function and pain behaviors changed where in the yeah. CBT group alone, it did not change. Now I understand that the CBT portion is the CBT alone group is only, I don't know, maybe it's like seven or eight sessions. It's 16 hours of treatment. Yeah. It's 16 hours. Right. So it's not, it's not small necessary. 16 hours is significant. It, it's my question for you. And yeah. I know this is, this is hard. So we're talking in hypotheticals. Yes. And I'm biased in act. So this is why I asked this question. Do you think if a psychologist is only trained in traditional CBT and did not has never trained in act or mindfulness, which I know nowadays is hard to find because a lot of these things are starting to overlap. But do you think with just the activity pacing, schedule pleasant activities, flare up plans that are so common in CBT, do you think we, you would see such powerful changes in physical function and pain behaviors without the values Hmm. and exposure component that I think is so innate in PT slash act? Yeah, I know that has, really- I know that I know that the correct answer is well we need to study that but I'm I'm <laughs> we need I, to study that Joe. I'm a little more like <laughs> let's be a little more playful and that's kind of like you know look at what's the difference between scheduling pleasant activity versus values based living Yeah that's that's such a good question Joe So I also have a deep love affair with act so you're biased and I'm biased so everybody should take that into account when I answer this I think there are some nuanced differences that contribute to those outcomes, because I also see those outcomes when I teach the ACT group alone without the physical therapy piece. So there's something about ACT that's different than what, not saying it's better, it's just different. And I have to wonder if it just goes back to that carrot the fact that people are 
lining up their behavior in an act group for chronic pain. They're live, they're lining up all of their behaviors and, and we can categorize everything under behaviors, quite honestly, like they're lining up all of their behaviors to be in line with who they want to be. So one of the things that we explore is how do you want to show up for yourself today? How do you want to show up for the people in your, in your life? It's this conscious choice that we are shining a huge spotlight on and then magnifying that bigger and bigger. And so I can't help but wonder if it's that component. Again, it would have to be studied. I'm just coming at this from a clinical lens, but I can't help but wonder if it's if it's that component that is make that's making the difference in what we're seeing. Um, Corinne, what are your thoughts on that? Because you've been involved in the CBT groups, you've been involved in the in the back in action. I think that. I, I agree with you, Heather. I think that when you're struggling with something difficult and you're focusing kind of on the struggle versus mm. uh, where you want to go, you it's hard to see and you get lost. And so that's kind of the difference that I see with the people that can participate in the groups. They're still focused on the struggle. Um, they, they, they may not want to be right, but it's it's not changing their shift of where their attention is to where they want to be. And and I think that's the that's what I notice when people complete both because we've seen. Many people complete both. And I think Joe mentioned, we'll even see them a year later when they something happens and something derails yeah. them. And the people that have finished our program or even an act only program, they, they, hand, they are more resilient. And we should try to measure that somehow as well. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can punt that to our research team yes. <laughs> or some research team somewhere in the world who's listening to this. Please explore this so we can see if we're correct or not. <laughs> well, on that topic, what, what's like, do you guys have next steps for back in action? Yeah, we do. We are very excited about our next steps. So, you know, I think with, with COVID, um, it's really opened up a platform that wasn't available to many people, which is the virtual visits. Um, and so previously we were actually running a back in action program when COVID hit. <laughs> so, um, Previously, we would have them come in Tuesday, Thursday, twice a week, four weeks, or excuse me, six weeks for four hours, and they would have to drive there and participate and drive home. But with all the opportunities for virtual visits, we would like to be able to launch this virtually. Uh, it just takes a lot more creativity on Corinne's end. I mean, mine I could launch tomorrow because I've got it all set up. I've got the booklet and the manual and all that. But you know, the gym piece and the, the movement piece is far more complicated. Yeah. So part of what we've been doing this whole time is we've been trying to launch the pieces a little bit separately and see see how they they work before we integrate it back in together and relaunch. Yeah. It's so. interesting. I mean, obviously the exercise part, because you have some gentle yoga in here, you have some Tai Chi, mm -hmm. um, graded aerobic exercise. So those things are, I mean, some of them you can do online and some of them are a little bit more challenging, although it does, from a PT perspective, put you in the place of more as a, I don't know what the right word is, working on your counseling skills, so to speak, versus working on the actual like doing to someone, which is so common in PT. Yeah, there there is a lot of creativity that um, is involved with this. I think, again, some of the kind of going back to even the program itself, I can be very... Um, uh, transparent and say there wasn't a lot of doing things to people in that program because the whole goal of the program was to have people learn how to take care of themselves and like you said be resilient with that and so we may have instructed people you know in, or done things in the maybe for one week one and two and then everything else was um, they were taking care of themselves with with us to supervise and that also provided a safe place right for them to learn the skill that maybe they needed to use to take care of themselves. I just wanted to also comment that they're not just taking care of themselves, they're taking care of each other in a very supportive way. So you'd see people, because I would pop into the gym also to go around and touch base with people. I would see people doing like single leg balance and the person struggling and they'd be like, what's, what's your value around this? That's right. Your kids matter. I mean, it was, it was incredible to see that camaraderie 
from the group or when someone has a really bad week and they're struggling and they say, you know, I've got that same passage on my bus. Mm-hmm. But but last week you had this. You still got this. This is just more difficult. And to see participants supporting that language, well, wow, just made my heart sing. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. incredible. So we we would also need to figure out like how to recreate that piece of it, which I also think is incredibly important, which would be harder um, virtually. But I, I still think we can still think we can do it. Maybe a, maybe a group component there might be interesting too. Well, the gym is a group component. Yeah. So when, you know, it would be, would, I guess that's a creativity part that Corinne would have to come up with of, you know, how would we set that? But then they also have the psychological component where they could certainly share those things as well. But I think all these little pieces, they matter. And so it's not just launching it virtually. You have to think of what are the things that you can't measure <laughs> like that, it makes a difference. And I think these real world treatment options. So I should remind everyone they can find this study in the June, 2021 journal of back and musculoskeletal rehab. Again, the, um, the manuscript of the paper is called effectiveness of a multidisciplinary rehab program in real world patients with chronic back pain, a pilot cohort data analysis. I want to thank Curran and Heather for joining me this week on the healing pain podcast. Um, let everyone know how they could follow you and your work, Heather and Corinne. How can we follow you and keep up to date on what you're doing? Yeah, Corinne, go ahead. Oh, so uh, if you, I'm on Twitter, um, I'm at DPT uh, under Dash Cooley. So you can follow me there. I'll always be posting um, any new publications or talks about our programs there. Uh, it's also the Stanford website, um, the, ho- the hospital website. Yeah, and I'm uh, at Dr. Heather King on Twitter. Um, and then again, just going to the, the Stanford website um, or even reaching out by email. If there's anybody, it's just hking at stanford.edu. Good. So I'd love everyone who's listening. If you're on Twitter, you can tweet to them and just thank them for obviously their work that they've done in this great study and um, for all the input they provided on today's podcast. So please tweet to them. And for me, reach out to me on Instagram. So just my handle is at Dr. Joe Tata. If you take a screenshot of today's episode and just tag me and I'll make sure to tag you back. Um, At the end of every podcast, I ask you to share this with your friends and family, colleagues on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever anyone's talking about um, the non-pharmacologic, safe and effective ways to treat people with chronic pain. I'm Dr. Joe Tata. It's been great being here with you this week and I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit IntegrativePainScienceInstitute.com. That's IntegrativePainScienceInstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.